favorite brands have a story attached to it. A story that grows anew, passes through generations and becomes almost ingrained within it. Few companies in India have lived that truth as well as high design. A small and young company that has had a big connect with the changing India thanks to a compelling story attached to it. A story that started in 1978 when a young Princeton scholar decided to follow his heart and make bags in a small factory on the quaint shores of Pondicherry. Inspired more by ideology than business, what's fascinating is how Dilip Kapoor went on to create a 100 crore rupee company and remain close to where he began. So when we caught up with him at High Design's main factory in Pondicherry, I had to ask him, how did he do it? I think the question really is, why am I sitting in Pondicherry? I think that's really the question you have. And then how come you can work out of a place like Pondicherry? Hmm. Um, I think the decision was first to move here. When I finished my PhD, uh, I wanted to be back in Oroville and I wanted to be here. And, you know, so the choice was made already. And high design, whether it was a 100 crore company or whether 50 or 200 or 500, was secondary. Hmm. And the fact that it's so become being here was primary. Primary. There's very little connection between a PhD in international relations and what you're doing, <laughs> <laughs> and why international relations? Well, I enjoyed it. You know, liberal arts education in America, I think, in the best universities, they don't. You know, the subject is secondary. Mm. The fact that they open up your minds mm. is what's critical. And uh, so, what did you do your PhD in? I was comparing Japanese ways of working with Indian ways of working. Which is a good, good way of uh, setting up a <laughs> manufacturing unit, I must tell you. But uh, uh, joke aside, when you set up over here, it yeah. started off as a hobby. We, it started we've, as a hobby. We've all read about how you started off in a, in a small uh, you know, workshop and you know, how yeah. the whole movement grew. But there are a lot of things that happen the other way around for high design. You know? uh, the traditional way of doing business over here would be setting up a leather export unit, supplying to big brands outside and then evolving and that's what 90% of Indian companies have done in the space. In your case it was the other way around. You created a brand first and then moved in. So that, that's an interesting uh, True, journey. But I mean you're putting too much on me that I knew what a brand was. I had no idea what a brand was. Okay, you're right that I think what it was led by is that we, it was a hobby so it was led by creativity. You know, that was more critical to me. So I wanted to make my own designs. I didn't want something that everybody else was doing. I didn't, essentially, high design was a rebellion against what was there. I didn't like the bags the way they looked. I didn't like these very shiny synthetic bags. And, you know, I wanted something very natural and very rough and, you know, real in a way. Uh, and something that was ecological also because I was living in Oroville and that was, in, um, you know, one of the core values that I had. Um, so I think, you know, to me it was just, okay, I wanted my own designs because I wanted it to reflect who I was and what I believed in. Uh, so the creativity was more important than the fact that I was going to sell it. You know, sales happened because there were people who believed in the same things. And they came, even though that market wasn't already developed. So it went into alternative stores. You know, I never thought I'd sell to a department store. I never thought I'd sell mainstream. You know, when it happened over time, it was each time it was a wow, they're going to carry high design? Wow, how amazing can that but be? But there was a leather connection, right? Your, your father had yeah. a leather uh, factory in the north. So, I mean, yeah. was it a natural uh, journey into this or was I mean, it, it something? It has to be genetic. I never saw it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> genetic. It has to be genetic. Uh -huh. My father sold it when he came to the ashram. Hmm. And I was only four or five years old when I came to the ashram. I was only four years old. So, I actually never saw my father's factory. Um, you know, what happened is when I was finishing my PhD, I ran out of my scholarship. And yes, I think I used my father's background to get a job, you know, because I was applying for jobs and one of the companies I applied to was a leather bag company. Uh, I was just looking for a job, that's all. And I wrote to them saying that I come from a family of, you know, people who know leather. So he must have thought I knew leather and he gave me a job. And uh, so that's how, uh, you're right, the background helped, except that I didn't know anything about it. Dilip might not have known very much about leather, but he did know what he liked and in 1978, 
He began making leather satchels that gradually became a must-have for all those who visited the Oroville Ashram where Dilip had grown up. Over the years, word of mouth helped and soon Kapoor's little home production had to get bigger. I think it was a constant ramp up, you know, you know, went from, you know, having one person to having 10 people and suddenly realizing I couldn't do it on my terrace. Then I did, took a bigger house and they were the whole downstairs of the house. Then I realized they were taking over my house, then went to another house. All this happened fairly fast. Um, but, you know, over, it, I would say it was, it was five, six years before I would say I was a company. Until then, I could still pretend it was a hobby. Mm. You know, until I had 30, 40 people. But were you in denial also? <laughs> you didn't want to? Definitely. And I, I, are you serious? I was serious in, in serious denial. Yeah. Um, all the way until I built this factory in 1990, that is like 10, uh, 11, 12 years, I kept calling it a hobby. And every evening at 5 o'clock, I would quit. You know, I would just go away and I'd go to the beach. You actually did that? You yeah, just, just every day I would go. Shut shop at, at 5 o'clock? Every day, every single day. Huh? Um, and yeah. when did you stop doing that? Uh, I regret that. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, when did I stop? I think as the pressure got more and more and as, you know, and we started working later and later. It must have been 19, late 90s. Mm -hmm. what, what changed it for you? What, what uh, made you think that perhaps that, you know, this could become a far bigger idea? Because somewhere down your journey, the ball started rolling pretty quickly. Um, I think as long as I was working abroad mostly, my connect with the customer was not emotional. It was my connect with the product all that time. You know, I was relating to the product. I loved the product. I loved the way it was. I designed it myself. All the products. So there was a clear product. But you know, by the late 90s, I was really bored. I was ready to give up, you know. And then in the year 2000, I started working in India. And I would have actually liked to continue the same way. Find a distributor who handled the customers and I just did the product. But I couldn't find. So I had to make a shop. And once you make a shop, you've had it because you know, then you're directly in touch with the customer, <laughs> you know. Uh -huh. And you have to start thinking of the person who carries your bag. You, you're no longer thinking of the bag, you're thinking of the person who carries your bag. And when I started doing that, the whole thing changed. Dilip claims that the discovery of the domestic Indian market was really the game changer for him and the company and the numbers reiterate that. For example, till 2000, 92% of the company's sales came in from the Western market. Today, more than 65% come from India and new markets like Vietnam, Malaysia and Russia are the others driving growth. Over the years, this shift in focus has also forced high design to grow up, to scale up and expand. More on that and why this has brought the company to the crossroads after this break.